Hey, everybody. Welcome to this outstanding session on storytelling and visualization. I think we have six presentations. Each presentation will be approximately nine minutes and then followed by three minutes of Q&A. And I guess the Q&A is happening via Slido, but uh, I'm happy to run around as well with the microphone if people want to ask questions in person. The first presentation is a virtual one. Uh, it's called Breaking the Fourth Wall of Data Stories Through Interaction by Yan Shi Ooh, Tian Gao. And this one uh, has received best paper honorable mention. So the expectations will be quite high for a quality talk. So why don't we, why don't we start? Hello, I'm Tian Gao from Intelligent Big Data Visualization Lab, Chengzi University. I will be presenting our work, Breaking the Fourth World of Data Stories Through Interaction. This work is in collaboration with Professor Yang Shi, Xiao Han Jiao, and Professor Nan Cao. As a communication medium, data stories are increasingly integrating interaction to support exploring their essential elements, including data, narrative, and visuals. Interestingly, recent years have witnessed an emerging interactive approach to data stories, which requires input from readers. A key design idea in these stories is combining interaction with the narrative device, breaking the fourth world, as known as BTFW. Originating from theater, the fourth world is an imaginary world that separates actors from the audience, while the other three worlds bring the scene. In data stories, the fourth world convention also exists and can be flipped around through BTFW interaction which directly addresses readers and asks us for input related to themselves. Our work explores BTFW interaction by following three complementary methods. First, we interviewed five data story experts to understand the benefits as well as challenges of applying BTFW interaction to data stories. Second, we searched the data stories that are integrated with BTFW interaction and coded them to identify design patterns. Third, we conducted a user study with 109 participants to link user attitudes to those of the storytellers in the expert interviews. From a range of online sources, we collected a corpus of 58 data stories that leverage BTFW interaction. After data collection, we coded the corpus from two aspects. First, what is the input of BTFW interaction? Second, what is the output of BTFW interaction that responds to the input? We analyze the input of BTFW interaction, which is the actions from readers through the lens of the data information knowledge wisdom hierarchy. This is a widely recognized series that originated from the field of information management. We think that the input from readers also goes up in the higher levels of the hierarchy, from data to wisdom. Then we coded the output of BTFW interaction, which is the reactions from stories, by analyzing how it integrates the input into the narrative or features of stories. To do this, we used the narrative structure developed by Emily. This narrative structure, based on free text pyramid and coarse narrative grammar, is used to classify the sequences of data videos regarding their role in the narrative, including establishment, initial, peak, and release. After coding, we found that these samples can be grouped into clusters, which is colored in blue in the framework. Samples in a thin cluster show similar characteristics and constitute a design pattern. Based on the observation, we identified six design patterns of BTFW interaction that are commonly used in data stories. The first pattern is Golden Hook. Using Golden Hook, a data story is started with a establisher based on readers' personal data or knowledge. This design pattern can only be found at the beginning of the story and is used to help readers quickly understand the topic. Much like a fish gets hooked by bait, 
Golden Hook attempts to captivate readers and makes them want to read more. The second one is Kaleidoscope. It is used as the initial of a data story where supporting facts are provided to reveal deeper insights. This design pattern requires readers' personal data as a supplement to the supporting facts and then presents the data as personalized visualization. It serves the intent of persuading by delivering more convincing arguments backed with data provided by readers. In the next, Simulator uses visualization as the input interface for exploration in the initial of a data story. Statistically, the visualization models a fact or a theory and exposes parameters that readers can manipulate to change the behavior of the simulation. By making a series of decisions, readers can learn the facts or the theory by experiencing it themselves. Then, Spotlight is applied at the peak of a data story, where the major insight is shared with readers. With this pattern, the major insight is presented as a visualization, usually in a form of a map, to encourage readers to explore. Specifically, the visualization asks for readers' addresses and highlights the data points related to them. Magic Mirror is also used at the peak of a data story and can produce the most personalized story of all the design patterns. Stories combined with this pattern usually take the form of a grid or calculator, integrating readers' data or information into the communication of a highly customized major insight. This pattern helps reflect who you are and, more importantly, provides personalized advice to improve one's current situation. Finally, Touchstone helps reveal the major insight in the peak of a data story by promoting readers to make a guess. Before showing the actual data, Touchstone asks readers to predict it based on their knowledge. Then, readers are showing the visualization of the actual data against their prediction. Meanwhile, Visual and textual annotations are added to the visualization to emphasize the difference between readers' guesses and the actual data. In this way, readers are more likely to reflect on the gap and be impressed with the major insight. After identifying the six design patterns, we conducted a user study to understand its benefits and concerns. The user study consists of three sessions. In the reading session, the participants were presented with two interactive data stories chosen from our stimuli and a non-interactive data story, one at a time. In the interview session, we conducted a semi-structured interview with the participants to learn about their reading experiences. Two weeks after the interview session, we invited our participants to complete the record session, retelling the details of each data story as much as possible. The result of user study suggested that BTFW interaction can significantly enhance self-story connection, user engagement, and information record, which is aligned with what we learned from expert interviews. Also, concerns about the interactivity comprehensibility balance, information privacy, and the learning curve of interaction were also raised when using BTFW interaction. That ends my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for this high quality presentation. Uh, we do have some questions on Slido. One is, is the development of the framework based on any theoretical foundation? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, guys, can, uh, can you guys hear me? Yes. Ah, great. So, uh, yes, that's a very good question. And uh, we actually had a similar discussion in depth during our research. So uh, the framework is based on a key metaphor of interaction, which considers uh, interaction as dialogue. Uh, so with the concept of dialogue, the interaction is often viewed as a cycle of communication uh, between a user and an interactive system. So actually, we can perceive actions from the user and the reactions from the system uh, with this 
uh, metaphor. So uh, in the context of BTFW interaction, the reader's input uh, can be obviously considered as the actions from the users. And uh, while the uh, personalized output from the story can be perceived as uh, systems reactions. So uh, this mapping relation finally convinced us to adopt this, inter to adopt this framework. Great, great. That answer was too short, by the way. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Sorry. Um, we have another question. Why are some interactions with the same type of input and output are classified into different patterns? Uh, okay. Yeah, so uh, in the figure of the framework, we do can see some uh, interactions that share similar uh, similar uh, input and output, but divided into different groups. So uh, that's a very important decision we made during the research. And the reason why we finally divided these interactions into different patterns is also these patterns share the same type of input and output. However, they are presented in different forms and serving for significantly different purpose. Uh, for example, the pattern of spotlight is usually in a form of map, and uh, it often discusses some grand topics like uh, environment protection. While the pattern of magic mirror is usually presented as a quiz or calculator, and it often talks about uh, topics related to individual lives, like your health. So uh, based on this observation, we decided to take these interactions apart. Yeah, that's the reason. Very good, very good. Okay, in, interest, in the interest of keeping with the schedule, let's uh, move on and thank our speaker again. So the next one is called Arato Cooperative Data Story Editing via Fact Interpolation. Say that 10 times fast. Um, by Mengi Sun Ligan Tsai Wenwei Su, Ooh, and then and more <laughs> et al. <laughs> uh, looking forward to a great presentation. Hi, everyone. I'm Mengi Sun from Tongji University. Today, I'll be presenting our work. Erato Cooperative Data Story Editing via Fact Interpolation. This paper is co-authored by me, Li Ganchai, Wei Wei Cui, Yan Chiu Wu, Yang Shi, and Nan Cao. Our team are researchers from Intelligent Big Data Visualization Lab in Tongji University and Microsoft Research. As an effective form of narrative visualization, visual data stories are widely used in data-driven storytelling to communicate complex insights and support data understanding. However, to create data stories, one requires a variety of skills, such as data analysis and design. And there are so many limitations in both manual story authoring and automatic story generation. A tool that supports human machine cooperative data story design and editing is desired. To lower the technique barrier, we introduce a cooperative data story editing system, Erato which allows users to generate insightful and fluid data stories together with the machine. The system leverages a novel interpolation algorithm to help users insert intermediate frames to smooth the transition between keyframes. Before we start our project, we organized five workshops and collected the participants' feedback. We summarized their comments into three design requirements. Inspired by this, Erato fulfills the requirements and through which the user only needs to focus on what to tell and how to tell the story. 
and how our system works. Here is the system architecture and pipeline. It consists of three major components. The fact embedder, the interpreter, and the story editor. We will cover each of them in turn. The fact embedder employs a bird based deep embedding model with two fully connected layers. It can project data facts into a vector space. We fine tune the model on a loss function, which contains two parts. One tends to reduce the distance between related facts. The other tries to line up the vectors of succeeding data facts in the same data story. The interpreter is designed to interpolate between a selected pair of keyframes to generate new facts in the middle. It uses the Monte Carlo tree to search the fact space and expand the corresponding nodes. We list a set of constraints in the table to guarantee the generated nodes that are meaningful and closely related to their predecessor. A reward function is designed to guide the exploration of the fact space. A searching path closer to the desired direction is encouraged. And how does it search? The vector representation of each potential fact makes an approximated projection in the desired direction. And then it chooses the closest node as alternative interpolation facts. The interpolator repeats the above steps until the current best node is close enough to the target node. Finally, the searching path is used to make a match with the midpoints, and the set of facts that closest to each midpoint are returned in order as the interpolation results. The story editor applies the above technique and the design of the interface consists of four main parts. The data story view, the story mode, the fact mode, and the storyline view. It supports interactive editing functions, where users can freely create a data story by first simply adding, configuring, and arranging some keyframes into a storyline, and then interpolate between them to generate meaningful stories content. We evaluated Erato and the techniques via a series of evaluations. We conducted a controlled study to verify the consistency of the similarities calculated based on the facts embedding vectors and perceived by users. The result showed that our embedding model was consistent with human cognition. A quantitative experiment refers to five-fold cross-validation is to estimate the performance of the proposed interpolation technique. The results show that the interpolation fact is close to the ground truth. To verify that our algorithm was able to create high-quality results from a user's perspective, we manually created 15 short data stories consisting of five data facts and replaced the middle three data facts of each data story with another three data facts generated by our interpolation algorithm. Then we mixed all 30 stories together and invited 50 participants to differentiate these stories. The paired t-test show the difference was not significant. To further evaluate the usability of Erato, 
We conducted an interview with three domain experts and asked them to make the data stories show on the right. Let's take one as an example. It is a data story about Disney movies from 1937 to 2021. It contains three keyframes imported by the user and the three corresponding interpolated facts generated by our technique. It interpolates the fact of the average annual box office between the number of films released each year and the ranking of fields. After that, it shows the box office share of the most popular movie, The Lion King, and its rating on IMDb. We can draw a conclusion at the end that the IMDb rating is positively correlated with the box office. To conclude, we have presented Eroto, the first intelligent system designed for supporting human machine cooperative data story design, which employs the novel data content interpolation technique. The evaluation shows the power of our system. Thank you for listening. Thank you for that presentation. Can you hear us? Can you hear us? Yes. And oh. can you hear us, guys? Can you hear me, guys? Yes, yes. We have a question for you. Uh, the first question is, it looks like the interpolation technique needs the starting and end points, but how do people decide the start and end facts as the input keyframes? Oh, thank, thank you for the question. Uh, we have proposed the interpolation technique for data content interpolation, and uh, we have considered this. Um, people can configure the facts they are interested in or based on the selected data corps and the underlying uh, system analyzes and uh, uh, recommends a set of important data facts to help users quickly understand the data and uh, inspire them to create meaningful and uh, interesting stories, um, uh, which avoid the code start problem. Okay. Uh, the next question is, how can you ensure the accuracy of story interpolation when the input tabular data is complex and how much time is consumed by the interpolation process? It's quite a good question. And thank you for the question. Um, to ensure the accuracy of the interpolation results, we have trained our model based on 100 high quality manually uh, generated data storage. And we also defined several constraints to guarantee the generated nodes that are meaningful and closely related to their predecessor in the search process. And in the future, the quality of the embedding model could be further improved by training it based on data storage with more uh, designs that are uh, with high quality. And we acknowledge uh, the current system has some uh, performance bottlenecks. Uh, it usually takes about 10 to 40 seconds to run the interpolation algorithm, which sometimes results in considerable waiting time. And in the future, we will uh, improve this and uh, with a uh, low time to generate the results. 
Great. Thank you. Okay, let's thank our speaker again. There are two more questions, but in the interest of keeping with the schedule, I suggest maybe sending the questions directly to the authors. Okay, our third presentation for this high quality session is Geo Storylines, Integrating Maps into Storyline Visualizations by Galina Holstein, Vanessa Peñana Araya, and Anastasia Bezarianos. Hopefully I didn't say that too bad. Hello everyone. My name is Vanessa Peñaraya and she is Anastasia Bezerianos. And we are going to present Geo Storylines. Storylines are a compact way to visualize how the relationships between people evolve over time. In these storylines of the Lord of the Rings, we can see four lines that represent the hobbits. They start out together, but later in the story they split up so their lines diverge. Both in real-world datasets and in the stories, relationships are usually linked to one or more locations. However, the signs that combine the storylines with just special um, geographical space mostly use abstract representation of places, so we cannot know what is the geographical relationship between the places involved. For example, in The Lord of the Rings, the locations are great contours with names. But if we look at the map, we can now see more information. The hobbits travel in completely different di directions, which give us a better idea of their journey. Our goal with Geo Storylines is to combine maps and stories to show the dynamics of entities' relationships in their geospatial context. The design process of Geo Storylines started with a series of generative workshops in which participants created hand draw visualizations of relationships, time, and space. Through bottom up card sorting of these sketches, we identify six clusters capable of incorporating maps and storylines. We organize these sketches in a design space along three dimensions. First, how they represent the space. Do they use one map or several? Second, how they represent time. Similar than before, we can have one timeline or several. And third, how these two components are integrated in the visualization. We then analyze these designs in their legibility and their ability to scale well to large datasets and extracted the three most promising designs. Anastasia will give you more details about each of them. So these are the three designs. Let's look at them one by one. The first one is coordinated views. This design places the overall storyline on the right, and then we have the map and these are side by side. The highlighted locations that are seen here in orange in the map are shown uh, on, for the specific relationship that is closest to the left edge of the storyline. But let's look this uh, a bit in action. As the user scrolls, the highlighted locations are dynamically updated and linked with a line to the relationship that is closest to uh, the timeline. Here we can see a few people getting selected and the storyline and the locations of the relationships get highlighted and filtered out. The second design is map clips. Here we have one storyline that takes up the entire space and we have one map glyph per relationship internally in the timeline. The locations associated with that relationship are highlighted in the mini maps with orange. So let's see uh, an implementation. We scroll to see the entire storyline with the map leaves. And here we start selecting people and we see that all relationships and maps that do not involve them start to fade out. Finally, the third design is time glyphs. In this design, we have on the right several storyline glyphs, one per location, that are linked with gray lines to the corresponding locations on the map. So each individual storyline glyph only shows the people and relationships related to that one location. Let's see it now in action. We can scroll vertically to see all storylines. And we can select a location to bring their storyline into focus. 
If we select a person, we see this person highlighted in all storylines. To evaluate these three designs, we conducted two evaluations. First, we ran a user study with 18 participants using different geotemporal patterns that participants had to identify. And we complemented these results with two feedback sessions with domain experts and real-world datasets. In our user study, we compared the three designs using five tasks. Two were baseline tasks of identifying location and dates, and three were tasks that focus on geospatial patterns. For example, the distance of relationships, direction of movement, adjacency of movement, etc. But let's look at one task in detail. So here we will see a direction task. Our participant is trying to select a few people and is trying to identify the direction they followed in their relationship. So in this case, we have two people that move from north to south. Afterwards, after answering their question, they had to, to self-report their confidence and the perceived easiness of the task. We also conducted two feedback sessions with domain experts. First, with seven investigative journalism practitioners, we got feedback about their overall interest in combining storylines with maps in order to analyze the movements and relationship of politicians for their articles. And then in a second workshop with three practitioners, we explored their own data using the three final geostoryline designs that we just discussed. They used their own data sets that contained relationships extracted from news articles. These were big data sets with uh, thousands of locations and a few hundred people. And they tried to identify their famous local politician who over time changed the region they represented in local elections. So now Vanessa will summarize our results across both evaluations. So when analyzing our data collectively, we found that overall, coordinated views were more efficient and preferred by participants of our user study. We believe that scrolling through this design was similar to an animation, which explained why it was easier to see the geotemporal patterns of direction and adjacency. Our domain experts confirmed this intuition and asked for a play button to have automatic scrolling playback. A surprising finding was that although Matcliffe had small resolution maps, there were no error by participants of our user study when searching locations in them. However, the real-world dataset used by our domain experts contained maps with more than 1,000 locations, which made this design extremely hard to use. Finally, we found that time bleeds performed poorly in our user study, in particular for tasks that focus on the storylines in a particular location. Time bleeds should have had an advantage as they split the data per location. However, even here they were not the clear winner. We observe, however, an opposite reaction from our domain experts. They appreciate the time leaf design because it allowed them to focus on the story of a specific location as they usually do when working for a new local news article. In particular, they mentioned that coordinated views and time leaves are complementary designs. So in summary, we presented the design space of geostorylines aimed to integrate into storyline visualizations derived from a series of design workshops. We also presented the details of the evaluation of the three most promising design visualizations, both in a controlled user study and in feedback session with domain experts from data journalism. You can find our implementation code, data collected and analysis scripts, as well as the videos in the link below. Thank you for your attention. We will be happy to answer any questions now. Thank you very much. That was a very outstanding presentation. That was really good. Can you hear us? Yes, Great. I can hear you. Can you hear Great. me? Great. Yes, we can hear you. So the first question is, great presentation and techniques. Oh, that, the question just changed. How do, you, how do you imagine this could scale in mobile views often used in data journalism? Um, thank you for the question. I think that's very interesting because uh, there are two reasons to use geo storylines, right? One, uh, when we talk about the data journalism, 
what they, the mainly task is to explore this huge data set. So maybe in that domain is mobile is not very appropriate, right? But then the other will be presentation communication. And I think that might be a bit complicated because depending on the, of the technique, it requires a lot of scrolling. It does sense maybe, um, the first one coordinated use is more appropriate because uh, it, um, requires, um, you can see better the map and both the map and the storylines are kind of big. So even reduced to mobile, maybe you will perform, uh, better. However, yes, we will still need to, to evaluate that in, in, in with real users, right? So that's how I think it could be. Very good. Okay, we have another one. Nice work, exclamation point. With the combination of maps and timelines for storylines in a specific location, did you explore what level of spatial and temporal granularities work together for understanding the story? Yes, that's a great question, actually, because um, at the beginning, we uh, we tried for the user study. We tried to one of the tasks. We were thinking of different granularity levels of space and time and everything. But uh, just to keep the study clear, we kind of did not test it in the in in the end. However, when we did our evaluation with data journalism, they really expressed the need of this, both because uh, they they work in in France, so France map. They wanted to see sometimes um, the storylines by level of commune or department, so they wanted to see different levels. Sometimes there were a lot of uh, articles for a time um, interval, so they wanted to uh, merge and aggregate by by month or, or years. Uh, so there is the need, but so far, no, we haven't tested different granularities. And I think there is a lot of opportunities to interaction and, and to show the these three techniques with the, these different levels. Yes. Okay. You have a lot of compliments on Slido, by the way. Thank you uh, very we'll, much. We'll I really do, appreciate it. We'll do one more question. It is a very interesting work. Does the positioning of entities in the vertical axis try to approximate spatial distances? If not, do you think that would be an interesting change? Uh, no. So for now, for it, if you're talking about the vertical axis in the storylines, we do not try to to use a special um, positioning, just if the the grouping by kind of communities, right? People who appear together, they tend to be together in the storyline. Um, the second part was, if you don't think, uh, it could be interesting, but at the same time, it depends on the task. It, with uh, Our data journalists are interested in mainly seeing, for example, the relationship about people, for example, relationship about politicians. So they would like to know more about the relationships in terms of co-occurrence in news articles. So they will prefer to use the probably the, the vertical axis in terms of um, similarity in terms of that in how they currently um, interact in the real world. So the map will be uh, the complement of how they interact geographically. Um, I'm not sure how that will change, but I think I think it will be better to keep them a bit separate so you the user can focus in this both in the relationships, how people re re relate to each other, and then later the how they the distance in the maps. Thank you very much. Let's thank our speakers again. So now we're going to transition to our in-person side of the paper session. The next paper is called, oh, let's see if I can say this, Rosling of Fire. Did I pronounce that correct? Rosling of Fire. Semi-automated storytelling for animated scatter plots. I like the the title, by the way, it's very good, very creative. And the uh, authors are Min Jun Shin et al. <laughs> and uh, we're looking forward to a good presentation. Hello. Um, 
thank you for coming to my talk. Um, in this presentation, I'm going to talk about rustling fire, semi-automated storytelling for animated scatter plots. Um, this is a joint work between organizations of UNIST, ANU, IBM, and University of Maryland. Uh, I am Song Ang-go from UNIST. On behalf of the first author, Min Jung Shin, uh, who is working in uh, industry now. Okay, um, the main motivation of this work is the Hans Rosling's video, which has 40 million views by now. And every, I think, I believe that everyone watched or at least heard of the video. So in the video, he talks about global trends in health, economics, heavily relying on data and interactive and animated visualization. And then after we watched the video that we think that um, this is a new kind of presentations using animated data visualizations. In fact, we can find this type of videos in uh, uh, many domains, just like uh, with different visualization techniques with different types of data. And we, uh, we, find the, um, we find these are common uh, in that they all try to communicate information about data. They include an interactive or animated visualization. And more importantly, that um, there always is an in-person speaker. Uh, we think that this is a new genre of storytelling, uh, which we call data presentation. Um, here is a brief summary and comparison of data presentation to existing storytelling. I think that the main point is uh, whether the presentation is designed for in-person speakers or at least try to uh, mimic in-person uh, presentations. So we have, uh, there are four uh, contributions in this work. Uh, first, we conducted a formative study to define a design space of data presentation. And second, based on the design space and design rationals, we design a prototype system called Rustling Fire, the data presentation authoring tool. And then we conducted two side user studies to evaluate Rustling Fire and we also discuss lessons learned and design implications for future research. Okay, let's take a look at the uh, design space. So to consider the design space, we collect data presentations uh, from online streaming services, such as TED, uh, TED Talks, news and weather reports, and many other data-driven organizations. And then two of the authors call it the uh, videos and extracted taxonomy of data presentation techniques. So which includes gestures, a visual effect, and animation playback. This is one example of our analysis. And for example, that um, this is Hans Rosling's gesture. And we, we think that this is a, a shaping gesture where he uses hands for indicating the width of, uh, between data points. This is another example of Hans Rosling's video. That's uh, what we call tracing. Initially, he pointed out one data point, and as the visualization is animated, the one data item is moving, and he's tracing the data point uh, using his hand. This is a... Um, This is a um, prototype system that we developed. And the system has three views. And the first view is presentation output view, which allow users to turn on and off the labels, change the position of the labels, and edit and check the narratives at the bottom of the view. When the animation when the visualization is animated, it is, uh, the highlighting mode is on, uh, which changes the color of individual items, and the entities are clustered based on temporal proximity. The next view is event exploration view. For example, if we can take this view, uh, the second one for Asia uh, in the GameMinder dataset. In the left side, we have hull traces, 
to show the temporal distribution of entities for each legend. And we also use line chart to show the changes in values and capture the trend in each data demand. There is an automated uh, anomaly detection or event detection algorithms, and there are seven event detection, uh, seven types of events, rise, drop, trough, peak, plateau, spread, and user defined. To, to produce automated narratives, we use templates. So for example, here for the rise event, we have a template like D in G increased between um, the starting time point and end time point, and which actually transform a data into a narrative like life expectancy in Europe increased between 1915 to 1918. So at the bottom of the system is the presentation editor. There are two timelines at first. The top timeline is for running time of the presentations, and the second bottom, the second timeline is the data time of events. And in the in this view, you, we put initial segments, which is located at the beginning, and explaining basic components. And if you can remember the Hans Rosling's video that one of his famous and popular strategy is to explaining X axis and Y axis. We exactly try to incorporate and follow that strategy uh, in the system. And there are blank frames initially, which is autom uh, automatically created. And each data snapshot is played for a unit time and presentation up of view shows the default mode here. And then we have detected algorithms and we have event segments. And there we place the blank frames if an event is detected. For a group of events, we have event groups. One event group consists of intra, events, and outro. And when this part of events is played, the presentation of a view shows the highlighting mode. And when the animation is played here for events, it automatically rewinds multiple times to play different events in the same period. So the top one shows the events about Asia, the bottom figure shows the events of Europe. So when the animation is played for these events, the, um, it runs slower than a regular speed. And also users can edit the um, presentation in the view. Users can swap the order within a group, delete events, or edit the playback time. To evaluate the system, we conducted two side evaluation. Uh, one is for author side, the other one is audience size. In the author size, we ask participants to create data presentations using Rosling Fire with GameMinder dataset. And we created a data presentation and put it online, ask people to grade the functionality and storytelling techniques incorporated in the system and uh, overall completion levels. We also have um, participants pick the intervals that they think most interesting. So the results show that in the authoring evaluation is that um, the participants think that the system is easy to use and uh, fun to use, and that they actually use the system they found, uh, they find many new insights as well. The audience um, side evaluation results show that um, the participant gave high scores to different storytelling techniques that we extracted, and these, uh, these help the people better understand uh, data presentation with the narratives. And this is the, uh, the intervals that our participants think interesting. And 
The one thing that is notable is that, the, you know, the, uh, I mentioned the Hans Rosling strategy in introduction that actually that helped um, people understand their presentation a lot. And the storytelling techniques, like uh, uh, the con uh, country tracking and cluster labeling incorporated in the system also uh, help people understand the data presentations. But we have one thing that, uh, we have one thing that is interesting is that in the author size, the authors think that um, gave low score in cluster labeling and rewind, but the audience actually uh, like the cluster labeling and rewind, which actually help them understand uh, data, uh, data presentations. Okay, there are limitations in this work as well. Um, I would not go over all of these. Please read the paper. But uh, I'll give you a short um, summary of that. So we have um, initial e event detection and clustering algorithms, but the final story may be different based on algorithms. And we use the scatter plot uh, for demo demonstration purposes, but there could be different types of visualization technique uh, which can be used for data pre uh, presentations as well. The last idea is um, interesting that uh, maybe we can uh, simulate the Hans Rosling because Hans Rosling's presentation is so effective, but the, it is not the main scope of this work. But um, once we give the data and make the uh, presentation as if Hans Rosling is presenting, uh, this is an interesting uh, idea. Um, I conclude the presentation by uh, suggesting you to watch the video and the entire source code of the system is uh, available so that you can go ahead and uh, download. If you can think of any novel, interesting storytelling techniques incorporated in the system, please do so and share with us. Okay, uh, this is the end of my presentation. I am happy to take any questions. Okay, in the interest of keeping with the schedule, we're just gonna have one question. Uh, very cool work. How can Roslingifier be incorporated into further realistic use cases such as newsrooms with extremely large screens, augmented reality, et cetera? Specifically, how could we sync human gesture characterized in your design space with animated visualization for seamless data presentations? <laughs> okay, I, I think that there are uh, two questions, <laughs> so pretty much long. Um, the first thing is that how we can use um, uh, this for uh, many other domains. And actually, we um, use the um, COVID data, and once we load the COVID data, the system quickly generate a new story. And then that is uh, the appendix of the paper. I think I suggest you to take a look at uh, how the system automatically generate uh, stories about the COVID. And the second thing is about, uh, the second thing is exactly uh, what I mentioned about simulating Hans Rosling's. So obviously the goal of the work is to um, help people create their presenta presentations as if there, uh, there is an in, um, in presenta uh, there is in presentation speaker but obvious there is no presenter. Um, that is an interesting point, how we can mimic or simulate, for example, gestures of Hans Rosling. We did, um, we did the coding and extracted many uh, storytelling techniques and presentation techniques, but to do, for example, gestures, we need humans, but the question is, can we do gestures, mimic the gesture, incorporate gestures in the presentation without human? How can you do that? That's the future work that I mentioned in the paper. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. So the next title is Nanotilus, Generator of Immersive Guided Tours in Crowded 3D Environments by Ruadia Alhabi et al. And we're, oh, that's a long list of authors. <laughs> uh, we're looking forward to a great presentation.
Um, okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Ruwaid Al Harbi. I am a PhD student at KAUST. Today, I'm happy to present our work, Nanotulus Generator of Immersive Guided Tour in a Crowded Tree Environment. This work is a collaboration with UV and Nanographic. The occlusion management strategy developed to address the crowdness in desktop application inhibit the feeling of immersion. Our paper proposed a new visibility and guidance approach that preserved the immersive aspect of virtual reality. Computer-generated animation is a popular method for communicating the life science to the general population. In our previous project, we generated this animation that described the current state-of-the-art structure of SARS-CoV-2. But in this type of storytelling, the viewer has a passive role and no control over the story. It is highly informative and often used approach, but is not as engaging as putting the viewer in charge partially and being responsible for the development of that story, as is done in the interactive movies or games. Yesterday, a documentary paper presented a method that based on the user textual story generates fly-throughs of molecular model using real-time scientific visualization. In this video, it's provide engaging visuals that shows a sequence of interesting structure on HIV in the blood plasma model. Biological models are densely packed with molecules. To reveal the structure of interest, Molecumentary employs a traveling cataplane, which ends up with removing most of the scene. When deploying Molecumentary's visual tour into immersive environments, the experience can be described as watching a movie in immersive setting. The user takes an outside perspective into the scene, and as a consequence, the user might feel detached from the scene and she can never be completely immersed in it. We call this type of ecocentric view an outside in view, where the users view the entire scene in front of them. Here you can see both camera and third person view that shows the HIV capsule protein. In, in VR, we have surround vision. In general, the immersion comes from multiple aspects such as stereo vision and multi-sensor representation. But probably one of the most important factors is the large field of view. If my scene is very small and just in front of me, the feeling of immersion will be lower. We propose to rather employ a sparsification strategy that preserve the immersive, overwhelming feeling of the environment so that in VR, the viewer is surrounded by all the structure that form the model. We call this type of ecocentric view an inside out view, where the user is placed in the, model, in the middle of the scene and the scene elements are located around and behind the user. To create the inside out experience, our sparsification is localized around the camera and we formulate it as a geometrical object that surround our viewer. In our case, this geometrical object is ellipsoid with variable size. To avoid sudden instances disappearance and to preserve the smoothness of the presented information, our sparsification is staged through three nested co-centric shell elements that approximate the change in the visibility function that varies from zero to one where zero means nothing is visible and one means everything is visible. To increase the variety of the information displayed in the scene, our sparsification strategy prioritizes the removal of redundant structure. In this example, we have two types of structure A and B with different importance value. All instances in the innermost shell have been removed regardless of their importance to avoid the block view. While some less important instances have been removed from the second and the third shells. Immersive guided tours requires a bath that visits places within the 3D model mentioned in the storyline. 
In this example, target one and two. Previously, only a straight camera movement was needed, because, uh, bec which was possible because we had the model before sparsified drastically everything in the space and there was nothing to avoid in the flight of the camera. But with our sparsification strategy, this is not the case anymore because we, we have things around the camera and therefore we need to have a dedicated journey planning strategy. To preserve the immersive experience and minimize the number of instances that need to be sparsified later, the constructed path is designed to navigate through the model natural void spaces. The algorithm identifies these void spaces by analyzing the depth buffer, and then select the biggest and deepest cluster to create a line segment from the camera to an instant located at that cluster, which define the next camera step, as you can see here in this video. Then the scene is rendered again and the process is repeated until the target instances is detected in the ID frame buffer. To convey the multi-scale hierarchy of the 3D model to the user, Nanotolus perform a multi-scale sparsification. It detects the appropriate scale of the target instance and sparsify the model accordingly. I would like to simplify the main idea behind the multi-scale sparsification by this metaphorical example. Imagine that our camera is surrounded by trees of different kinds of fruit, apples, lemons, orange, and cherries, and our target is to observe the entire content of a particular apple. This hierarchy can describe different scales in this scene. The trees represent one scale. Each tree consists of a fruit, which represents another scale. And each fruit consists of covers, core, and seeds. In our way, the camera will meet the orange, and it will sparsify the entire tree, because our target is not there. The same will happen with the lemon tree. But when it comes to the, to the apple, the whole tree should not be sparsified because our target is there. So rather, the sparsification will be done in a lower scale, the scale of individual element. And when the camera reach to the target apple, the sparsification will go down farther in scale and decompose the target apple into core, cover, and seeds. The same logic is applied in molecular model. For more detail about the multi-scale sparsification algorithm, please check our paper. Here, you can see side-by-side -side comparison of guided tool generated by Nautilus and molecular on SARS-CoV-2 in a blood plasma model. The experience in VR can be conveyed in very limited way through this video. We evaluated the inside-out versus outside-in experience in a formal user study with the 29 participants. While users can maintain a better overview using outside-in sparsification, the study confirms our hypothesis that Nautilus leads to stronger engagement and immersion. In principle, we can smoothly combine these two sparsification geometries, provided both are formulated as implicit objects. With such a combination, we can enable a general oversight view using molecular sparsification, which is blended back into the immersive experience of Nanotolus. Here, the QR code of our group website, where you can find more information about our paper. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to answer your question. Thank you very much for a high quality presentation, and your timing is perfect. 
Uh, we, I don't see any questions on Slido. Does, am I missing anything? Did, does anybody see any questions on Slido? If not, I do have a question. Um, who would you say is the target audience of your software? Um, our, our target is the, the general population. So anyone can, um, uh, who want to gain more, better understanding to of, uh, biological content and information. And you, you had a user study? Yes. Is it, and who, who participated in the user study? We chose a master and a PhD student, bio, bioscience mm -hmm. student, so they have information and uh, previous information about uh, the models that we presented for, for them. Very good. Anybody feel like asking a, an in-person question? Okay, I have one more question. Do you think this would be useful in an educational setting, like for teaching, for example? Uh, yes, I think so. So, um, so the biology can be um, communicated to the student in an engaging way. And this is our goal, is uh, to make, make uh, um, uh, the, the viewer to be immersed and engaged in the, in, inside uh, the, the, the VR. Very good, very good. Okay, let's uh, thank our speaker again. Okay, and we're here at our final presentation for this high quality paper session. So the next paper is how do viewers synthesize conflicting information from data visualizations? And it's by Pratik Mantri et al. Looking forward to a good uh, presentation. Hi, everyone. I'm excited to share this with you. Uh, but first and foremost, this work is led entirely by my student, Pratik. I'm more like a freeloader on that, but unfortunately, he couldn't make it here. Uh, so I'll be presenting on his behalf. But please don't hesitate to reach out to him for questions, concerns, and complaints. And if you have any compliments, please forward them over here, okay? All right, we're all on the same page. Um, so get started. So science, I believe we all agree, is a quite important component of our life. And to make scientific knowledge accessible, engaging, and memorable, scientists and journalists, they leverage data visualizations and news articles to turn scientific findings into easy to digest summaries. However, scientific progress can be incremental, and it's common for subsequent work to offer contradictory results. So for example, imagine deciding whether you should keep drinking coffee or not. And your internet search yields two results, one source telling you that drinking coffee is good for your health, but other one says it's bad for your health. Now, what are you going to do? So scientists often write reviews of existing work by carefully assessing evidence, making comparisons, and building connections across studies. So we all have written or read a background section here or there where the researchers offer systematic reviews to help both themselves and other researchers synthesize existing findings. However, the general audience out there reading articles online are likely not equipped with the same commitment or resources to conduct such systematic, rigorous reviews or synthesis. So we conducted a survey asking crowd workers what they would do when they come across conflicting pieces of information. And this is what we found. Note that one person could fall into multiple categories. So most people will keep searching. So this one participant wrote, I continue doing more research until I can find what the truth is or at least which side is more favored. Some will evaluate the quality of the evidence they find. This participant wrote, I want to know about the veracity of each side before deciding what to believe. Some will even compare information across multiple sources. This participant wrote, I consider each separately and try to see if there's a connection or some parts that correspond to each other and then look at the differences. However, some will rely on their gut instinct or common sense, and some will seek out information that validates their beliefs. 
And you can see all these strategies can be subjected to cognitive biases, such as satisfaction of search bias, or confirmation bias, or recency bias, among many others. So to mitigate these biases, we should think about how we can build tools or present information in a way that can empower people to more effectively synthesize information and make informed decisions. But before that, we need to investigate the underlying cognitive mechanisms behind how people synthesize information. So we conducted a series of experiments here where we asked participants to synthesize information and report their mental representation. And the results revealed systematic biases in our information synthesis behaviors. So let's experience what it's like to be a participant in our experiments. Let's say you're interested in the relationship between some variable x and y, and after an online search, you'll find a reputable research institute producing this chart, which shows a negative relationship between x and y. So just to be sure, you dug a little further, and to your surprise, you find this other chart from an equally reputable institution showing a positive relationship between x and y. Now, what do you think the relationship between x and y really look like? Try drawing a mental line. Some of you may be thinking, this is the line, or this, or this, right? So we asked participants to synthesize the two pieces of information and use this widget to draw a line to represent their mental representation. And this is the average line they drew. Uh, just to bring back the information they were asked to synthesize for reference. And if um, they were, and here's the gray line showing the mathematical average of those two lines I showed them. So if people were to weigh the two pieces of evidence equally and they can do math perfectly, they should be drawing that gray line. But instead, the red line, uh, the more positively sloped line, is what they drew. And in addition to asking them to draw, we also asked them to estimate the y value when x equals 20 and when x equals 80. So in this case, we would obtain two points and we would connect them to draw another line. We call this the verbal version of the synthesis response we got from them. And we can compare the verbal version to the drawing version to the mathematical average, and you see that both of these elicitation methods deviated from that mathematical mean. And just to bring back the stimuli for comparison, this is the first chart people saw, this is the second chart people saw. Uh, so what is happening here? So participants seem to be biased to see the slope as more positive than the mathematical average of the two slopes. And of course, we did our thing where we counterbalanced and controlled for everything. Um, but from now on, I'm just gonna refer to them as chart one and chart two. And we tried a bunch of variations where we pit two slopes that are in opposite directions against each other. And we see very consistent results in their response where people are biased to see the slope, the, to, to see the slope, the synthesized slope as more positive. And um, being a perception researcher, it might be, I understand it might be a little bit hard to see that result from these slopey angles because angles are not the most perceptually accurate visual encoding channel. So I'm going to visualize this result for you in a different way. I will show them to you via position encoding so you can really see the subtle small effect sizes or big effect sizes. So I will plot the slope value on this number line horizontally. So on the left side, there is negative slope. On the right side, there is positive slope. And this is the slope of the first chart they see. This is the slope of the second chart they see. And here we have the mathematical average. And this is what they drew with the widget. And this is what they typed, with, they, they did with the two dots, the verbal version and just creating some shorthand and move it over, and you can really see this bias towards that positive slope in their response. And to show you the results for the other ones, you can see it's really consistent across the board, depending, doesn't matter which pairs of correlation we showed them. And uh, we tested a bunch, and so just to give you a sense of um, how they compare to each other, I'm just gonna normalize everything by matching them on the negative slope and matching them on the positive slope and just smash everything together, and this is our ultimate result. Okay, so uh, when two slopes were shown to someone in opposite direction, people synthesized the slope in a way that is biased towards the positive slope. And the charts that we showed them so far have, are labeled with abstract variables x and y, but we also conducted a series of follow-up experiments where we created more realistic variables and stories around these charts, such as talking to them about this is, this is 
information about water usage and crop yield, or this is information about public spending and quality of life. Uh, we even did a version where we put descriptive text around the chart and really told a really full story around what is happening that supports what the chart is showing. And here are the results, and you can see that across the board, the bias is very systematic and very consistent towards that positive slope. So now your brain might want to synthesize this information that I just presented you, and then you become worried about potential biases in your synthesis because um, the results are quite similar, and I've only showed you what happens when you're synthesizing conflicting information. So you may be wondering, how do we synthesize information when the two charts are showing more consistent results, like my experimental results over here? So to translate that, we also ask the question, how do people synthesize information when the slopes are more similar, when they are in the same direction? And in this case, they can be both positive or both negative. And just to start off by showing some data on the both negative condition, uh, instead of plotting the negative slope on the left and the positive slope on the right, I will plot the stronger slope on the left and the weaker slope on the right. So the red line shows the average participant response, and the gray line shows the average stimuli, which means is the mathematical mean if you are good at this and I can do math perfectly and it's not biased. So this is the result of how participants synthesized when they saw charts labeled with X and Y, and this is the result of um, the charts that were labeled with water and yield. And these are the results for the spending life quality with the whole story around it. And again, you can see very consistent result, but different from what we were seeing earlier, uh, people seem to be biased towards the weaker slope when they see two negative slope that are more similar to each other. So just to reiterate that, when both slopes are negative, people's synthesis behavior seems to be biased towards that weaker slope. They think that the synthesized slope uh, should more closely resemble that weaker one. And we, spoiler alert, found very similar result for the positive version of this. I'm just going to plot everything the same way. There's the stronger slope on the left and the weaker slope on the right. And here are the results for all these conditions. And you see that the effect sizes are very similar across the board. And participants seem to think that the synthesized slope would more closely resemble the weaker one. And what's interesting is that the effect seems to be stronger when the slopes are negative compared to when the slopes are both positive. And these kind of findings supplements the previous conditions where participants saw the opposite slopes where they were biased towards the positive one. I also want to add that this is uh, the beginning of a long journey, so like exploratory investigation, and we have a lot of ideas to follow up, on, follow up on this. For example, how does this work? Does this only work for perceptual synthesis, or will it generalize to verbal versions of this? And how does this bias towards the positive slope in the conflicting information relate to, say, confirmation bias? And do these synthesis biases have implications for memory or decision making beyond just being perceptual? And future work should really dig further on why we're seeing these biases, their implications, and how we might use these results to inform visualization designs to help people um, uh, uh, seek and synthesize information. That's all I have. Thank you for your attention. Okay, great. Thank you for the great presentation. We have a massive tension right now between the number of questions in the, in the Slido and the coffee break. Um, if anybody has any tips for me, I'm, I'm open. Okay, let's, let's ask a first question. Would the results be different or similar if there were no visualization in the stimuli? For example, are we predisposed to accept more positive numbers? That is a very interesting question. Reminds me of Marty's talk on Tuesday about how we should include the text-only version as a baseline, which we did not do. We, we were treating this as a more visualization-only thing, but um, in speculation of the whole, the condition where there is a story around the visualization and people exhibit the same biases in uh, similar effect sites, I would suspect that uh, maybe when it's less visual, maybe we'll see less biases, just because we didn't see the compounding effect of biases uh, between the 
condition where there's only the visualization and the condition where there's visualization and text. However, I don't know, I'm just speculating, but very great question. I love to keep figuring it out. Okay, I won't be able to get through all of these. Um, I'll do a few more. Can you explain the distribution gray line in the summative experimental plots for positive versus negative slopes for cases with text or story? It looks as if there is a long tail towards the positive responses for some of the charts. Yeah, really good question. So um, the distribution was really just, um, we surveyed, there's, uh, I didn't talk about participant size, but there's, a thousand to three hundred people in this experiment, so we really got a nice distribution across the board. And um, you're right; there seems to be sometimes um, a distribution towards the positive side, but we don't. I don't. Ha it's a lot of speculations right now. We I don't have any any smart answers for why that may be. As I said, this is really exploratory, and I would love to look into explanations for all these effects, especially. Um, in reference to literature in learning sciences or cognitive sciences. Thank you for the question, though. Okay, we have another one. Could the bias towards the weaker slope come from participants giving random responses? Interesting. So we did ask a series of questions, and we had a series of different ways to elicit their response. I only showed you two, but there were multiple ways to elicit response. And what we found is really consistent result across the board. So I would imagine if people were putting low efforts, they, they, might be, they might not be as consistent because we really tried to ask them some different ways. And I suspect that when the, the bias towards the weaker slope might be an effect of people wanting to be more, more conservative when they see all these uh, information. It's kind of like someone who's trying to sell you something uh, really enthusiastically and you become a little bit conservative about whether you should buy it, right? So um, there are similar biases in social, sci social psychology and cognitive psychology, uh, but um, there may be, we may be looking at some parallels in terms of how people synthesize information. Thank you for the question. Okay, I, I guess I'll just do one more. There are lots more. Uh, I'll I be guess... around to realize yeah. that, right? If you kind of... It's a, good, it's a good sign when you get lots of questions. Do you, do you also record whether the participants are right-handed or left-handed? Oh, no, we did not record that. Uh, that is a really interesting thought. I, uh, whoever asked that, I'd love to hear more about why you asked it. Um, but I, I do want to say, I do want to say that uh, because we elicited their response in so many different ways, in addition to drawing, they have to type numbers, they have to drag things around. So I, 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 I was hoping that all these different elicitation methods would somewhat um, uh, counterbalance the potential biases caused by each of the elicitation methods, right? Like biases in drawing might be accounted for when you're typing in a number. So i um, really hoping that um, these additional peripheral uh, factors wouldn't play too big of a role in here, but I'd love to hear more about it. Okay, I think we're gonna wrap it up since we're all thinking about coffee now, but uh, let's thank all of our speakers again. Thank you all so much.